Ambassador. Mitigation measures we have, are you considering that? Could you tell us something about what you're doing in that regard? And then the other thing, uh, the sea is a good source of food. Uh, what are you doing uh, sea-wise in order to look at uh, food production? Thank you. First, you're talking about reforestation or deforestation? Reforestation. Okay. And, yes. So we, first of all, forests don't really exist here in the UAE. So when we talk, date sorry, date okay, date palms. When we look at date palms, um, one of the issues that we're facing here in the UAE is that a lot of the date palms are actually using or, or use a lot of water. So what's being done now is the date palm uh, farms are being looked at with a very different, let's say, lens to look at what kinds of seeds we actually need to be looking at. And this is where uh, looking at things like uh, genomic um, analysis of different seeds, uh, looking at how to encourage also farmers to look at other um, crops that they should be focusing on that are less thirsty as well. Um, dates are, we've got actually two types of foods that we are growing um, enough for the demand of the UAE, it's dates and cucumbers. Uh, dates were actually producing, I think, more than 200% of, uh, of our needs. Um, so the date growing is gonna be is gonna be changing. There's gonna be laws and regulations coming just because it's a very thirsty um, uh, way of growing. So this is probably gonna happen in the next few months of how we can make them more efficient and ensure, because it's also got a cultural uh, connection to it. A lot of the farmers grow date palm trees not for commercial use. It's kind of a recreational um, area. So it'll always be an important um, uh, crop that we'll, we will be growing, but we need to make huge changes on what kinds of palm trees or what kind of seeds we will be using and how to ensure that we don't produce so much waste. There's a lot of food loss and food waste happening. And so the, the efficiencies will need to be looked at here. On the aquacultural side or fish side, we are also uh, people who love fish. I think we, uh, our, our fish consumption is more than double of the global average. Uh, we import um, also, I think, about 85% of the fish uh, that we eat is imported. Um, on the fisheries side, um, this is again now in the new ministry that I've come in, they do all the regulations on the fishing. But what we're trying to do now is look at how aquaculture can contribute more to what we're doing. Um, some of the initiatives that we've taken is the government has invested in a hatchery and this hatchery will be in operation by the end of the year. And this hatchery will be supplying um, fingerlings for the aquacultural sector. So looking at local species and also um, species such as salmon. There is already a fish farm actually growing salmon here in the UAE. Sea bass, sea bream are also on the top and then come some of the local species. So aquaculture will be something that you will see be picking up now as well. Why is it picking up? Because of technology, because of the RAS systems that have now been developed that can actually be uh, used uh, in land as well. Because we actually don't have uh, seas with depth, so sea cage farming is a little bit more difficult for us. Okay, thanks. Oui? Thank you so much. Yeah. Fascinating presentation, and Thank I you. cannot but uh, suggest you to visit the OECD in Paris, which has an excellent team working on fisheries and especially aquaculture, and that has been monitoring the policies in aquaculture of its uh, 77 member countries and partner countries, so I'm sure there's a lot to, to discuss there. Um, I'd be interested to know, um, the UAE is one of the very progressive countries in the world and you are developing nuclear power as we speak here and there's a couple of reactors that are going to be commissioned soon and, and one is already operational. So this gives you obviously a lot of electricity at some point. And so the question is, what are you going to do with all the electricity? So you might do hydrogen, um, but you might also increase the desalination of water right, in, in the country. So what are the plans in, the, in this respect? 
um, because it's very electricity intensive. And, and the second question related to the international dimension of the uh, kind of uh, um, sustainable agricultural hub that you aim to develop here. Um, Israel is obviously a leader here, and uh, we've heard and discussed extensively today the Abraham uh, uh, Agreement. Um, to what extent um, is there a strategic partnership in, in the making with Israel uh, uh, in this? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Marc Antoine. Um, so, yes, on the, on the water side, or let's say the desalination side, we've seen huge steps uh, in the UAE trying to make the whole desalination procedures more sustainable and that to try to decouple desalination from power generation. So reverse osmosis is now really picking up and uh, moving forward, all new desalination plants will be using the RO systems um, with very much uh, having always sustainability at, at our hearts because we know, I mean, at the end of the day, we are a water scarce country, so we will be using the desalination process. But as the UAE commences and takes also the responsibility of saying, okay, we are also um, uh, responsible global citizens, we have to ensure that whatever we take forward when it comes to... Um, uh, producing energy, when it comes to uh, desalination, we need to ensure that we're using the right technology to reduce our carbon footprints. And we are really, if, if you've noticed, we have a, a special envoy for climate change. We have a ministry for climate change. So for us, climate change is really on the top of the agenda. And this cascades down to all um, the stakeholders to ensure that they are aligned with what we're doing. And as we near COP26, uh, um, there was a gentleman who said, okay, there's a lot of, um, a lot of talk, but how can you make sure that you have the buy-in? How can you make sure that it doesn't, the cost doesn't go up so high that you actually can't afford it anymore? So, What's really important, this is in, in my point of view, is having those stakeholder engagements. And we have now, going towards COP, because we'll be participating in COP, we have done uh, something called the Accelerator Program, where we've brought in all the stakeholders from across the country to ensure that everyone is aligned, everyone understands what we, what we need to do. And it's really important to find a balance we can't go completely in one, di in one direction. It's, it's just, it becomes way too expensive. And I think when the consumers actually understand what cost implication this comes on them, but it's, it's about understanding what it means because doing this transition, it would be amazing if we could all reach the targets, but we know that the targets are difficult. But let's say if we're able to reach some sort of percentage, all of us together, at least it's better than nothing. We're going towards that right target. And so for us in the UAE, the leadership is very keen on making sure that whatever we do, we need to think of the economic growth, but we also need to ensure that whatever we do, we take a technology that is sustainable, that has the, the, at the least carbon footprint possible. So there's a lot of work being done on technology innovation um, when it comes to, to desalination, for example. Um, Food Tech Valley, yes, and, and Israel. I actually was there uh, a few months ago with, with a delegation. Um, I've been visiting a lot of countries to try and bring them on board uh, to Food Tech Valley. And of course, Israel being one of the countries with uh, excellent technologies and innovations when it comes to water, how, how you can grow with very, very little water. Uh, for me, it was my prime country to go to as soon as the Abraham Accords were, were signed. It was like, yes, I can go to Israel now. I can, I can go and see what they have because they have the environment that we have here. And they're by far um, from where we are on growing foods uh, in, in desert climates. So um, we have, I think I received over 50 groups of companies from Israel in the past five, six months. And uh, I would say to 80%, they have shown big interest to come and join us in Food Tech Valley. And at the moment, we're going through the master plan. And uh, they are very much involved in the workshops that we have as well. Because we're looking at things also like cellular agriculture. It makes sense for us. Growing food in a bioreactor. Um, 
we want to bring those innovations here because also we know moving forward when you see the projections of this many billion people and we need to feed them, we can see there's a food gap going to come. Mm -hmm. And with all the waste we're producing, what innovations can we do to, to reduce that? So partnerships with so many countries uh, is essential for food tech value and Israel is, is in, definitely. Yeah, one last question, yes. Thank you. Very good question. I actually just opened the Desert Life Science Center just a week ago. And this is all about uh, genome sequencing of seeds. Um, so I was telling the people, I was like, it's, it's so fascinating when you actually see and understand traits of certain seeds to be able to say, okay, well, this, this makes sense to grow in harsh climates like the UAE. Um, this desert science lab has been set up with BGI, uh, which used to be Beijing Gen Genomics Institute. Um, and um, this partnership was made because we really wanted to um, further study uh, crops that can grow in our environment and also understand what crops would be good to grow in closed environments because it's, it's clearly a different um, environment. Having People understand how important this whole subject of GMOs also is, is, is essential because people kind of, they go with the flow. They're like, okay, everyone's saying that's not good. Then I, okay, I will say it's not good. Um, it's the same as when you say organic. Okay, organic and sustainable are also two, two different things. So when something's organic, then you know that probably this plant has had a lot more water maybe than another plant or it's at a lot more space um, and so the education is really important here and it's uh, for us here in the UAE again going back to the our we grew up here knowing that we bring food from outside so we have food here that are GMO we have food that are non-GMOs things need to be clearly labeled so we don't say we don't want or we do want we kind of leave it up to the UAE population to choose what they would like. But it's also important to educate because moving forward, there are many situations where it's not possible otherwise. It's because everything, what we're doing and, and pushing the climate now to much hotter temperatures, it's making it even harder to grow certain crops. So, Things are happening on that front, and so how can you make sure you're able to, to feed the people? So you have to always have these kind of, let's say, healthy discussions. And I had one of these at uh, the NYU, New York University. So we had students, and whatever their personal preferences, it didn't matter. But we kind of grouped them. We said, okay, you guys are pro-GMO, and you guys are against GMOs. You do your research and try to argue at each other. So it, it got them just to, to research, to educate about themselves, and then they had to take that position among them. But this sparked a really good discussion between the youth to understand the pros and cons. Um, so I think it's always important to look at this subject carefully, but also to understand how, how important it is and how um, it actually could solve many things if, if used correctly. And I... You know, the youth, I think, is really important when it comes to food systems, agriculture. I, we know that um, the age group of farmers are on the high side. And we know that the youth are not interested. If I tell them, you know, I'd like you to be a farmer. Actually, it's a, it's a joke in our culture to say, why don't you want to study? You want to become a farmer? I know, and that, that's a little bit of a... Um, so, so what I've done a little bit is I've kind of renamed it. I call them agri-technologists. I tell the youth, I tell the youth when I, when I speak to them, I said, you know, I'm not looking for a farmer. I'm looking for someone who likes technology and loves food. 
And they're like, well, that would be amazing. I'm like, yeah, agri-technologist. So I think it's time to spin in a new name, uh, work on the education part at school, work on the... I even uh, um, put together a book, a children's book, also for young children to understand what CEAs are, what what are what is hydroponic, what is... To, to understand that this is now the new way and actually farms can be in the middle of the city. Having women more coming into um, farms is, is amazing because the women actually are the ones I feel are very much about food systems at home. And uh, when they are taking this to the next level with, and the kids get so excited about it too. So I think it's, it's all, all interlinked together, but thanks for that important question. Thank you very much, uh, Excellency, for this uh, insightful uh, speech and, and, and the, the Q&A that was very, very uh, instructive. I mean, I, I like the, the new name, name of agro-technologist.